not have any understanding of the masses, and I believe that from the fundamental point of view, that is probably a very serious, a very interesting and serious problem. The particular work that I do is work on is this. It turns out that this theory of the gluons and the quarks is a very definite, precise theory. It has only one constant in it plus those masses, the coupling constant. The coupling constant, however, is large. And the method that we use to make calculations for electrodynamics that were successful, easy calculations, in which we approximate by first tiny out the diagram with the least number of, of these things and then more and more because the more you put in, the smaller the contribution because of the 1%. When the coupling is big, the diagrams with many of these and the diagrams with few of them are both are all important. And the problem is to add everything together in some other order, not just by starting out with no gluons and then putting in one gluon. It'll never work. It is true that at very high energy and very high energy collisions, it does appear as if it is right to start with an approximation in which you should have the minimum number of gluons and make a correction for one more gluon and so on. And in those experiments, you can calculate or predict certain trends which ought to occur. And those trends do occur in experiment, which is the only evidence we have that this theory is on the right track. Because at the present time, although we have a definite theory, we have a situation that's never before existed in the history of physics, we haven't been able to calculate anything from the theory. Therefore, we can't compare it to experiment. It isn't that there aren't experiments. There are hundreds of experiments with the strongly interacting particle, all kinds of experimental accuracy and detail. It's just that we can't calculate anything with this theory. And that's not because the theory is indefinite. We have a definite proposal and a definite result. Let's compare the theory to experiment. The usual thing you're supposed to do. It tells you in the book. Science is very simple. You make a theory, compare it to experiment. And if the theory doesn't work, you throw it away. Take, then make a new theory. Compare it to experiment, throw it away. Oh, here's a theory. Compare it to experiment. We don't know how. So we're boxed temporarily in making a method of calculation to compare it to experiment. Uh, so I'm trying, amongst other people, also trying to figure out how to improve our methods of analysis so we can make a, re a reasonable mathematical analysis of that theory. In all this, I disregarded, I didn't discuss gravitation. The reason I didn't discuss gravitation is this. Uh, the gravitational influence between objects is extremely tiny. So tiny it holds you in your seat. <laughs> Wait between microscopic particles, between electrons, for example, or between two muons or protons and so on, the gravitational force is very small. As you know, the force between two electrons varies inversely as the square of the distance and the product of the charges. That's electric force. And this whole gravitational force is the product of the masses and inversely as the square of the distance. And one varies the same way as the other. And one is very much smaller than the other. In fact, the gravitational force if you don't like big numbers before, you're going to get them now, is weaker than the electrical force between two electrons by one followed by, I mean, the factor is one followed by 40 zeros and uh, 41 zeros, perhaps. And that's uh, so tiny that it, you'd say, oh, that will never see gravity at all. The difference is that gravity is like a track, whereas in electricity, unlike likes repel and so forth. So when you have a lot of objects you have a large number of particles. The gravity keeps adding and adding and adding and adding, but the electricity cancels the plus and minus. So what we end up is that all the electrical forces, which are so enormous between the electrons and the protons, simply hold the electrons and the protons in a terribly intimate mixture of matter. Matter is a fine mixture of plus and minus charges, so fine they all cancel each other out, so on a large distance there's not much left. But gravity keeps on adding and adding and adding, and so at last, when we get to these ponderously large masses that we are, we begin to measure the effects of gravity on planets, on ourselves, and so on. Because of this, from an experimental point of view, it is impossible at the present time to get any experiment in which any quantum question about gravity is involved. In order to produce a gravitational influence, you have to have so much matter, so many gravitons, if there were any, that uh, the quantum approximation is unnecessary. Of course, it is not possible in the world to have this framework of amplitude on part of the world and not the rest of the world. So it is not a satisfactory situation to say that when the matter is big enough, I'm going to make this approximation and forget it. So the question does come up, is there a quantum 
picture for gravity. Yes, there is a quantum picture for gravity, and it's the same kind of business. A thing goes across. We have to have a different color chalk for that, and it's called a graviton, and it would be appear in this list, except its polarization quality is a little bit different than a photon. It's called spin two. And the gravitons go back. This picture has it that the gravitons go back and forth. But in any practical situation, there are so many of them that we can use the field theory without thinking about the quantum theory. It's also true that the quantum theory of gravity has infinities like the electromagnetic theory, but they seem to be a little bit more difficult to get rid of. Anyway, that summarizes all that is known by man. As far as I knew when I left Caltech before I started to give these lectures, it is always possible that somebody has figured something out in the meantime, or measured something in the meantime, that I haven't yet heard about down here in the Southern Hemisphere, which I am enjoying, by the way, very much. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this talk, and I'm open the situation to qu uh, lecture the questions. I guess I'll let you ask some questions. I'm done with this lecture. Could you tell us something about a possible relationship between quantum electrodynamics and gravitation? No. <laughs> I don't see it. I, they, they, they've got a long history. You see, at the time when Einstein worked out his theory of gravitation, he paid, there's not the quantum theory. It's the, what's called the classical approximation of the field theory. The other important theory in the world at that time was the theory of electrodynamics, also a field theory, not the, with the amplitude. And so at that time, the problem was to put the whole, was always the problem of physics, to put everything together. So at that time, the problem was to put electrodynamics and gravity together. All right? But the electrodynamics and the gravity were both wrong. They should have been quantum theory. And in addition, we find many other things in the meantime. The problem is to put everything together. There's nothing special about trying to put electrodynamics and gravity together any better than putting quark theory and gravity together, or what? The only one that I know how to, that there's some real advance in understanding how to go together so far is this W meson and photon. That's electrodynamics and weak interaction. The problem is to put them all together, ultimately. And that is the problem I was discussing, and how far we've gotten it is not very far. But I would not choose for historical reasons, to think it's more important to put gravity with electricity than to put any other combination together. Do the correction factors which you mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, and which operate at very short distances, imply that space is quantized? Yes, there leads to a lot of possibilities. It could be that space is quantized and so on and so on, but all the experiments, you see, are in agreement with supposing that distance is virtually zero. We don't know where it is. It's certainly way beyond the experimental range, which corresponds to 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. It doesn't mean that it could be quantized at 10 to the minus 20 centimeters. But this is this interesting feature. I forget the question. I forgot to repeat the question. <laughs> the interesting feature is uh, that if people try, when people have tried to make a theory that space is quantized, they get into difficulty. They haven't, nobody has made up a nice theory that space is quantized that agrees with observation. It's not so easy to make up these theories. What one does all the time is fall into one or another pit. Either you come out that the sum of the probabilities is not of all events is not 100%, or it turns out that you can get states of lower and lo uh, more and more negative energy. That would be very useful, because what we could do is we could take some object and send it into an energy is conserved. The total energy in the world is conserved. But suppose I had this object, I could put it into a place where it has negative energy, and get some positive out, because I start saying with zero. You want more? Put it in a more negative energy. Get more out. So it's obviously an unstable universe if we can have states of negative energy of ever larger possibility. These are the kind of things that happen to a poor individual who tries to make up a theory with some arbitrary thing like a lattice in space or something. He gets into that type of difficulty. There are very few self-consistent theories, and that's... Uh, the only ones we really know how to write are ones in which we suppose point like space, time, and these propagators with some masses in them, and one or another of the various kinds 
of polarization systems. These are what we call spin zero, spin a half. Spin zero, we don't have knowledge that there are any fundamental particles. Spin a half, all these. Spin one, the photon W and the gluon. Spin two is, uh, there is possibility in principle of spin three heads, but we know of no fundamental particle with that. Spin two is the graviton and so on. By the way, there are, uh, it's not the answer to your question, I finished your question, but I must remark that there are many interesting theories which try to put the gravity and electrodynamics, but they always invent a lot new uh, other particles that have to go along with it, such as spin three half fundamental particles and so on. But at the present time, the biggest of them is not able to come to, to include the particles we do find and invent a lot of particles we don't find. Why have gluons not been observed yet? I didn't completely describe uh, the gluon theory, and I don't be afraid. I'm not going to. But uh, just like there were three of these coming together, so in the gluon theory, there's also three of these coming together. I, I say that not in answer to your question, but to make a m something I had forgotten to say. Uh, this uh, is the place that smokes out as clearly as possible that we don't know how to calculate the most simple thing in this theory. The simplest thing would be what is the interaction energy between a pair of quarks as you pull them further and further apart. In the case of electricity, the energy it takes to pull a pair of particles apart the force it takes, the force it takes, goes down fast enough that it takes a certain amount of work and you can get them apart. The question is whether in this theory, as you pull the quarks apart, the force decreases fast enough so that you can do it. If the force stayed constant, no matter how far you pulled them, you could never get them apart. It is believed, hoped is a better word, <laughs> that if we really could analyze this thing, that would turn out to be the case. Now, the first thing you try is to uh, suppose it's the other way. And you find, no, there's something. There are terms in here that look funny. It's hard to calculate. It's not so easy to show that the force goes to zero when they get far enough apart. Therefore, it could be that the force doesn't go to zero if they get far enough apart. All I'm saying is the theory is complicated.